Well, good morning. I know some of you guys who were not here last week, it, it was less people because some of you guys are traveling and having a holiday. So probably for those of you who weren't here last, uh, last week, this would be my greeting to you for a Happy New Year. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> let us now turn to Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel 40, we're going to do 40 to 42. Um, Trust me, I'm not going to read all those verses. I know some of you guys are already very afraid I'm going to spend my entire sermon reading. I will not do that. Instead, I will read from selected verses, and I will start at verses 1 and 2. Please listen as I read the word of the Lord for us today. In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year after the fall of the city, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land, he took me to the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain on whose south side were some buildings that looked like a city. And then the vision comes, and he sees the new temple and new Jerusalem. This has been a very challenging week for Hong Kong, I think. We've made some headlines all over the world. I think BBC's covering us, and The Guardian's covering us, and I'm guessing uh, Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Uh, Some of the people that are running this publisher and and bookstore down in uh, Causeway Bay had been uh, disappeared. You know, it's kind of interesting that in our land, we use uh, active verbs into passive verbs these days. They have been disappeared. <laughs> I think it's, uh, these are troubling times, and we find times like these very uh, challenging for all of us, especially as believers in this city, in trying to live out our faith under such challenges. Ezekiel 40 is a perfect text for such challenges because we are now sitting here worshiping on a Sunday morning in a challenging time. Ezekiel talks about the exile in verses 1 and 2. Not only does he talk about the exile, he talks about the timing of this vision. If you look with me, it says, it is at the beginning of the year. This is a perfect text for the new year. So what exactly do do these people do at the beginning of the year during the exile? The Babylonians celebrate the new year uh, with various celebrations, I suppose. Chinese New Year would be something close. During the Chinese New Year, we do various things. Certain days, we're not supposed to go out because it's bad luck. Of course, as Christians, we don't believe in that. We don't believe in luck. But, you know, people still do things like that. Uh, In Babylon, things are more serious than that. They have a series of festivals in the first half of their January or their uh, New Year. And in their New Year, what they do is they celebrate their religion and they do parades of their gods. And they also do things like theater to reenact some of the myths of the religion so that they can educate all of the people in Babylon as to how great Babylon is. During this time, what they do is they'll do all these series of events and they will celebrate such celebrations in the temple or near the temple precinct in Babylon. In fact, I think we no longer have those temples. Some of them are in museums. Other parts are just ruins. But in those days, the temple is a very central part of Babylon. In fact, the king's palace is near the temple. On the 10th day of their January, this is when the vision came, you really wonder what's happening on the 10th day during the celebration. From our sources, we find out that they have a banquet hosted by the king 
for the people of Babylon. So people would come and gather and eat near the palace, and the king would host the people. This hosting of this banquet is a way to show how great Babylon is, how rich its king is, and also how great their gods are. So it is at this time that God had revealed this vision to Ezekiel. There are many different ways that people interpret this temple vision. Some people think this is a millennium. Some other people think this is the new Jerusalem. I think all those interpretations neglect to understand that this was set in Babylon on a new year during that day of celebration when a king hosted his banquet. God had shown a different, an alternative vision, a great vision, in the light of such challenges. Today we're going to talk about God's design for worship because the temple is there for worship. If we study this temple and we do it architecturally, we study it, it's really fairly impossible to, to make out this temple in a real architectural uh, building. But if you look at uh, 40 all the way to the end of this temple vision, really God is showing an ideal for the people of God to understand the design of worship. So what is God's design of worship? What are God's requirements in worshiping Him? In verses 3 and 4, we have the first requirement. The first requirement. Verse 3 says, He took me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in a gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. The man said to me, Son of man, Look with your eyes and hear with your ears and pay attention to everything I am going to show you. For that is why you have been brought here. Tell the house of Israel everything you see and then we see the temple. If we jump down to verse 17, we see this journey continue. Then he brought me into the outer court. There I saw some rooms and a pavement that had been constructed all around, at, around the court. There were 30, uh, 30 rooms around the pavement. Then we jump down to verse 20. Then he measured the length and width of the gate facing north, leading into the outer court. Do you notice there's vocabulary that repeats itself throughout this reading I gave you? You're thinking, why is he reading uh, these sorts of seemingly boring uh, verses? In fact, I love the first service. You know how you always shake hands with people at, at the... At the at the gate, I mean, at the door. <laughs> and one guy came up to me and he says, I thought you were an idiot for preaching out of Ezekiel. <laughs> but then it turned out better. <laughs> because it seems when I'm reading these verses, this seems like, what is this, right? But you notice the repeated vocabulary. This, this man, this person who appeared to lead Ezekiel, you notice he is directing Ezekiel every step of the way and also bring a measuring rod to show the greatness of this vision. What is a measuring rod for? It's there to measure. What's the cord for? It's there to measure. To demonstrate to Ezekiel the greatness of this alternate vision God has set before him, even though he's facing challenges. The first requirement of worship in God's design is to recognize who God is. To recognize who God is. If you think about this whole setup of the temple, it is set up by God. It wasn't built by Ezekiel. Ezekiel is just there to take a look at what is being designed. The entire thing was designed by God. In fact, it's very much this vision is directed by this man who, who just walks Ezekiel through the complex. I was in museums, uh, I was in various museums this summer vacationing with my family. And I noticed the museum, they have very strict rules about photography, right? You guys know that. Well, some people don't know that, and they would start snapping away. Oh, the classics, and they start snapping away with their cell phone and so on. Uh, especially flash photography, they don't want you doing stuff like that. And you see there are guards standing at different places to tell you, no, 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 you don't do that, right? That's what people, uh, therefore, to protect all the artifacts. There are rules in understanding. And if you want to exist in that museum and walk through the museum and like, enjoy yourself with all the artifacts and all the artwork, you have to obey the rules. 
And there are people directing you and telling you what the rules are. And if you violate those rules, they say, hey, it's not too good. So you need to submit yourself to the rules of the museum. In the same way, when you have this guide walking Ezekiel through the complex, Ezekiel is walking under the guidance of this man in recognition that this whole complex, this vision, is designed by God. When we, when we decide that God is greater than we are, and when we recognize that worship is first and foremost designed by God before we start doing anything else, I think it is important for us when we worship that we submit ourselves under God's authority. Ezekiel is being guided. He didn't just run all over the place and start looking. He was being guided specifically, step by step, through the complex in the same way, I think when we come to worship, a lot of times we need to adjust our attitude. And a lot of times we are frazzled by all the things that are happening around us or our ambitions or various things that distract us. This vision reminds us that we need to come in recognition of who God is and really in obedience to what God has to say. That's the first requirement. We must recognize who God is. It's the second requirement the second requirement is in, um, found in various verses. I'll, I'll read them as we go through. But the second requirement is that worship needs to be served by the right people. It needs to be served by the right people. There are sets of people in this description here. I'll read some of the verses. For example, verse 10, we have the first group of people. I'll talk about the architecture here in verse 10, 40, verse 10. Inside the east gate were three alcoves on each side. The three had the same measurements, and the faces of the projecting walls on each side had the same measurements. And you wonder what that's about. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire description because there are other descriptions of, of what's going on here. But this is the guardhouse, the alcoves of the guardhouse. Do you notice that at the very beginning of this vision, as Ezekiel enters through this vision, there's a description of the guardhouse and a measurement of the guardhouse. What is this saying? This is saying that the control access, the access to the place is controlled. People don't just do anything they want. So there, there is a need for guards to be there. But of course, the, the temple vision doesn't focus too much on the guards. It focuses on the second set of people. They're more important. In verses 40, uh, 45 and 46 in chapter 40, 40, 45 says, He said to me, The room facing south is for the priests who have charge of the temple, and the room facing north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, who are only Levites, who may draw near to the Lord to minister before him. So we have a group of priests who serve also in this temple vision. You know, a lot of times when we look at the Bible as a whole, especially the Old Testament, God is pretty stringent about who can and who cannot serve in the sanctuary. He has very specific principles and requirements. I think as we come into the New Testament, we no longer have a temple. A lot of times we start losing the principles that are set forth in the Old Testament as well. In the United States, where I come from, and I'll be flying out there tomorrow, back home, uh, the requirement for being a minister is becoming less and less. I don't know if you recognize that. Some of you guys on the stage, you would know that. Uh, people are not even required to get a, an MDiv or the proper education in theology before they become ordained in some churches. Why is that? Well, the reason is because, well, we have lots of churches with many posts open, but not enough warm bodies to fill it. So just about any warm body would do. Now that's pretty much some of, the, some of the church communities are like that. So the needs are great, obviously, but I, let me tell you something. There's no greater need than for Ezekiel's situation. Think about this for a second. Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, what is he calling for the people of God to do? The people of God are to return to Judah, to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple, right? Some of you guys have read Ezekiel. Some of you guys have not read Ezekiel. Maybe you should go and read Ezekiel. 
is a good book. And hopefully when I, after I preach today, you'll get a better sense of what Ezekiel is about. So I'm trying to get through a lot of stuff in a very short time. Do not worry, I will not go over time. So Ezekiel is trying to call God's people back after 70 years, 70 years of exile so that they can go and rebuild God's temple. Think about this. 70 years is a long time. Let's say I was exiled as a baby and I was one year old by the time I got to exile. How old would I be by the time I'm supposed to return? Somewhere around 69 or 70, right? Give and take. I don't think I'd be in any, any shape to return at 70 years old, uh, walking or riding a horse at that age. More than likely, my children would have to return from exile to Jerusalem. Now imagine this. These kids who were born in exile have never, ever seen Jerusalem. They've been told about Jerusalem. Um, they've been educated about Jerusalem. They've been, uh, Jerusalem has been described in the stories as parents told them. But, you know, describing you can only do so much, right? My children have attended this church. Uh, one of them was born in the United States. The other one was born in England. They've lived all over the place with me. And they're thankful that they lived in Hong Kong. In fact, my older one misses Hong Kong. He's, he often talks about Hong Kong. Maybe one of these days he'll find a job coming back to Hong Kong. Who knows? But if they've never been to Hong Kong, and when we were first deciding to come back to Hong Kong to work, I worked here for three years, I, it took me some convincing for my children. Luckily for them, they've lived in other parts of the world, so moving to a different place is not as traumatic, right? But I still have to tell them how awesome Hong Kong is, because they've never seen Hong Kong. So I had to tell them about how awesome Hong Kong is, and I have to show them pictures of high-rises and all the wonderful night scenes, and of course, I didn't tell them about the not-so-wonderful things. <laughs> Otherwise, I would scare them. I didn't tell them about them disappearing people or people being disappeared. <laughs> Hopefully, kids don't get disappeared. It, it would take some convincing if my children had only lived in one place all, all their lives. They only know one language, which is English. They're still not very good with other languages. French is okay, not so much Mandarin or Cantonese. For them to come back and have to relearn it in an entire culture, let's say I make them go to Chinese school. You know what? Chinese school is fairly useless in the United States. Some of you guys are nodding your heads. Maybe you used to live there and you had to go to Chinese school. It's quite traumatic for many Chinese kids because you only go once a week and you do this study and you do very elementary reading and then you study the rest of the week in English because you go to regular school and they expect you somehow to speak Chinese. You know, some of the kids that I used to pastor, Asian-American kids, they went to Chinese school and they would look at the newspaper, right? I show them newspaper and say, go do some reading for me. And they say, mmm, yang, <laughs> sheep. I said, okay, good. And what's the essay saying? They say, I don't know, but I can pick out the sheep. Well, pick out the sheep's not going to help you in Hong Kong. <laughs> it's hard for people to move from one place to another even if they have certain cultural background, my kids have some Chinese background, it's going to be hard for them to move to another place. It's going to take a lot of convincing for them to go back and rebuild the temple. If there's a lack of personnel for Ezekiel, this would be it, to convince them to go back. If you do a study on how many people went back, it seems like the Bible describes in the rosy picture, lots of people went back. No, not lots of people go back. If you do a really serious study of how many people actually were in exile versus how many people went back, not many people went back, and I don't blame them because they already settled in Babylon. Some people settled in Egypt, other people settled in other places, but they were not keen to go back. Although you lack personnel, it doesn't mean we have to drop the requirements. Take a look at God's requirement. God is quite stringent in the way he deals with certain situations. In chapter 44, chapter 44, you don't have to flip to it. If you're tired of flipping your Bible, just listen to my reading. Chapter 44, verses, uh, starting at verse 10, there's a group of priests that, that this God describes. The Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray and who wandered from me after their idols must bear the consequences of their sin. 
They may serve in my sanctuary, having charge of the gates of the temple and serving in it. They may slaughter the burnt offerings and sacrifices for the people and stand before the people and serve them. But because they served them in the presence of their idols, that's before, and made the house of Israel fall into sin, therefore I have sworn with uplifted hand that they must bear the consequences of their sin, declares the sovereign Lord. Now obviously all the priests who went astray, right, before the exile are probably all dead. So this is a vision. This is a vision. God is showing a vision of what happened before and of what he thinks about what happened before. This is what he thinks about what happened before. Those who have not served God faithfully were relegated to certain roles. Let me talk about this a little bit. You know, a lot of times we have this discussion or these sorts of uh, discussions over issues. If somebody fails in ministry or fail, have, have suffered certain moral failure, for example, would they be forever banned from serving in a faith community? That's a good question to ask. And people write essays about them. And the essays tend to fall in two different categories. The one category is on one extreme is because this person had failed, this person should never be able to serve in a faith community. And there's the other extreme that says, because we are a community of grace, we should extend grace to a person who had failed, let's say morally or in, in other areas, uh, to serve uh, in the church or in a faith community. So we should extend grace and let the person come back and do it. I think neither extreme is necessarily the right answer. Do you notice in these verses I just read, God allowed for the failed priest to come back and serve in this vision, but under certain strict boundaries. Under certain strict boundaries. God is not saying that you can never serve, but these people are there at the gate or doing the slaughter, doing the dirty work, these priests who had failed, but they cannot serve in other positions. It's no different than, let's say, we find somebody who, who had a previous crime, let's say, of sex crime. Let's say, for example, uh, child molestation, right? Do you think God can save people who molest children? Uh, yes, I think so. I think God can save those people too. As much as we don't like the whole idea, it's terrible, right? Because I have children, I'm a dad. But we don't let people like that necessarily serve near children, right? In the same way, this is what God's saying. If you take all my holy things and give them to idols... Well, right now, let me tell you, you can come back and work on my holy things, but you should do the dirty work, like cutting up animals. That's pretty much what you're going to be doing. You're going to be doing all the labor work. Okay? So God allows for people who failed in the ministry to come back, but to serve under certain boundary, because they have failed in these other areas, and they should not be getting in touch with those other areas. Now let us look at those who have not failed God and who have been faithful in verse 15 to 20. Just, I'll just go with 15. I won't read all the way to 20. In chapter 44, it says here, But the priests who are Levites and descendants of Zadok, same guys that we read just earlier in chapter 40, and who faithfully carried out the duties of my sanctuary when the Israelites went astray from me, are to come near to minister before me. They are to stand before me to offer sacrifices of fat and blood, declares the sovereign Lord. They alone are to enter my sanctuary. They alone are to come near my table to minister before me and perform my service. What God's saying is, if you didn't fail in worshiping the true God, I will reward you with a certain kind of service because of your faithfulness. So God does recognize faithfulness in service. A lot of times also we go into this extreme in our churches as well. We don't compliment people too easily, even if they're faithful, right? Because we don't want them to become proud. Well, that's the excuse. <laughs> but I think God recognizes people who serve faithfully. And making that distinction, these people can stand before God and represent the people of God because they did not fail to serve God when everyone else around them failed to serve God and serve the idols. 
So God does have standards when it comes to serving. It isn't just when we need a warm body to fill a pew, fill a position, we just grab just anybody. It is a difficult thing, I admit, in a volunteer organization like the church to get people to serve. But we read biblical principle clearly. We need to say that there are still standards. So let's be mindful when we serve God that we're not just serving carelessly. There are standards, both morally and also in terms of qualifications. In order for God, for us to recognize God's design for worship, the first thing I talked about, the first characteristic is we must recognize who God is. Second characteristic is that we must recognize that there are requirements and the right people to serve. Why is that? Well, it says here, when we see the description of God, it says God is a sovereign God. We get the right people in the right place to serve because they're not serving themselves, although they serve people as well. But ultimately, who are they serving? Whom are they serving? They're serving the sovereign God. So this is an important aspect and important theological point that we must also always keep in mind. When the right people serve, they've got to recognize there's a reason for the requirement because they're serving a sovereign God. The third characteristic of God's design for worship. If you look at chapter 42, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 42, verses 13 and 14. It says here, Then he said to me, The north and south rooms facing the temple courtyard are the priest's rooms, where the priests who approach the Lord will eat, will eat the most holy offerings. They will put the most holy offerings, the grain offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings, for the place is holy. Once the priests enter the holy precincts, they're not to go into the outer court until they, they leave behind the garments in which they minister, for these are holy. They are to put on other clothes before they go near the places that are for the people. Do you notice there are places where the priest would do their service, right? And you notice there's the description of the food they eat. They eat the offering. In the ideal Israel, those who serve God should never go hungry. Let's think about this for a second. People bring their best to God because they believe this God is a true God and this is a greater God than all the other gods in Canaan, correct? So they'll bring all the, true, all the good stuff to God and they would offer it as offering. Eleven tribes bring all the stuff to God and the Levites and the priests will eat all the stuff. You can imagine 11 tribes bring all the good stuff to God and only one tribe is eating all this good stuff. There's a lot of stuff to eat. Right? You got the grain which gives you your starch and then you got all the rest of the offerings that give you your protein. Uh, that is a kind of diet, a priestly diet. Maybe you can write a book about that. No, I will not do that. Somebody's already written about some other diets uh, based on the Bible. That's no good. So I'm not going to do that. But you can guarantee that the priests are not going to go hungry if the people faithfully bring the offerings to God. I find it interesting that this is the way God designed the priesthood in a way that really, even though the priests don't have land, they have as much as they need. Think about why people need land. They need land so they can farm and they can get the stuff so they can eat the stuff, right? And they can farm animals and farm grain and they can eat that stuff. The priests don't need land, you know why? Say, oh, that seems so unfair. Let me tell you, it's really fair. They're eating all the other guy's stuff. Like, 11 times more. I don't know how I can eat 11 times more than how much you guys eat. I'm thinking about lunch already. <laughs> in the ideal faith community, people who serve in such positions should be taken care of. You know, when we think about the way church salary structure is being made in many churches, I don't know about this church, nobody told me to talk about salary structure, so do not worry and do not start talking to Angie about stuff. Unless you want to give Angie a raise, that would be okay too. You know, people talk about salary, uh, salary 
structure for churches, right, and, and for people who serve full-time in vocational full-time ministry. And they're always afraid that the pastor will make too much, right? Oh, the pastor. I've actually, I literally heard somebody, not here, not here. Do not worry, James, it's not you. <laughs> I literally heard somebody who's a deacon said, the pastor cannot possibly make more than I do. What kind of logic is that? I think that deacon needs to read the Bible a little bit more. While pastors are not, are not priests, unless you're an Anglican or a Catholic, the principle, I think, still has some validity. Think about one tribe eating all the stuff from all 11 tribes. That's a lot of stuff. There's, these guys are not going to get hungry. Think about the way we do church today and the way we honor or dishonor the positions of those in vocational ministry. And I'm very impressed with um, what's going on here, even though Pastor Harry had left, and I know it's been a tough transition and, and there are challenges, and Angie still soldiers on, even though she has some, she has some rough weeks, and we, we need to pray for her, you know? It's just one person doing a lot of stuff, and I appreciate a lot of deacons doing all kinds of stuff. I know you guys are doing all kinds of stuff behind the background. Uh, it's tough, right? But that's one thing that we've got to stick by and in this new transition, we've got to understand Based on biblical principle, the servants of God were taken care of by the people of God. And you know when the temple started falling to disrepute and disarray, the reason is because people failed to bring the sacrifices to God and the priests would no longer have enough to supply for themselves. That is all in the Old Testament history. So God is trying to correct all of that and saying, you need to have a proper worship. The servants of God need to be cared for by the people of God. Do you notice as we talk about this temple vision, the very center of our sermon is really about the greatness of God. I think it's really bold for Ezekiel to be talking about this vision and seeing this vision on a day when the greatness of Babylon and greatness of Babylon's king, the Babylonian king, is being demonstrated throughout the great nation of Babylon. So the only question we have to ask is who's greater? Is Babylon and his king, are they greater? Or is God greater? Because the circumstances seem to be Babylon and his king are greater. Ezekiel shares his temple vision with others so that they can know that God is greater. And that's so they can start rectifying their mistakes as they return from exile to demonstrate, to demonstrate that God is greater. As we depart from here after worship, I hope people can see from the outside in these challenging times, in this challenging year, that because of us, they see our lives, that God is greater. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, indeed you are a great God. You are the great God above all gods. We worship you because of this greatness and because of your love for us. As we face this new year, our Heavenly Father, we pray for your guidance and reminder for all of us that worship is not some child play. Worship is to stand before your holiness with recognition of your holiness so that we can live as a holy people of God. Bless every one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.